today we will talk about uh, imaging of the hip. What are the imaging methods? Conventionally, we have got radiology and radiography, conventional radiography. And then earlier we used to take tomography, but today's tomography is forgotten. Instead, we have got computerized axial tomography. There are various methods, the conventional spiral, helical, MD, multi detector CT, etc. And then we have got magnetic resonance imaging, ultrasonography occasionally, particularly in pediatric hips, and then nuclear medicine, wherever, whenever you suspect some osteonecrosis of the head of the femur, early patties, you can use nuclear medicine with a gamma camera and technician 99 isotope. PET CT, positron emission tomography, using a nuclear isotopes, and then in association with that, computerized tomography. Computerized tomography gives anatomical resolution where exactly the lesion is. Whereas PET scan is highly sensitive, it picks up early lesions. Whereas the other methods like uh, MRI, CT, ultrasound may not pick up. This PET uh, scan picks up early on because it is so sensitive. And now we have to know what are the disorders of the hip as usual congenital or developmental disorders come first and then infections, inflammations, inflammations such as uh, arthritis or uh, sarcoidosis or uh, eosinophil granuloma of the bones, hemopoietic and uh, then we come to neoplastic, whether benign or malignant and then there are miscellaneous conditions. For this study, we exclude trauma and neoplastic conditions because this will be a long talk. Uh, first of all, we have to know whenever you are talking about uh, any pathology of the skeleton, you have to know what the normal variants are. Otherwise, a normal variant you may diagnose as uh, pathological and thus the patient gets into a disadvantage. Overlap of posterior lip of acetabulum, as you see on your left side, gives a, as if there is a fracture just on the head and neck of the hip. Before we study the pathological lesions of the hip, we have to know some of the anatomical variants. Otherwise, you will mistake a normal variant or a deviation of the normal as pathological and thus put the patient into disadvantage. Look at the film on your left side. There is overlap of posterior lip of the estabulum producing as if there is a fracture in the subarticular or in the head of the femur. And then next to it, you have got a lucent area, which is not uncommonly noted. Often we come across this problem, is it normal, abnormal, supposing the patient had multiple myeloma or a metastasis or some other uh, pathology, does this belong, can we correlate both of these two? No, not necessarily. This is what is called converging pit usually they are round or uh, ovoid and these are also called herniation pits. Usually they are less than one centimeter noted in the femoral neck and then erosion on the surface is noted that is why you see the lucency. This is because of the invagination of the synovium which is still intracapsular. So there is invagination of the synovium producing this and histologically there is some uh, collagen and uh, little new cartilage cells. So this should not be mistaken for pathological entity. Another one just showing, here somebody said it must be an osteoid osteoma because there is lucency and there is a surrounding sclerosis, but it is not so. See, often osteoid osteoma does not occur in a 50 year old or 60 year old, this 55 year old male. So please note the age also and the clinical condition before you make a definitive diagnosis. Calcified pectineous insertion at the, along the iliopectineal line, often mistaken for a periosteal reaction or even occasionally Paget disease, but this is a normal variation in elderly people. 
and on either side of the hip in the establer area, outer aspect, there are small triangular ossicles. This is not a detached osteophyte, but uh, this is what is called os acetabulare, that is an accessory ossicle. Usually it is triangular and anterolateral margin of the acetabulum is located. Should not be mistaken for old fracture either. Then we have van neck lesion at the ischio pubic junction. They fuse at varying times, usually 13th or 14th year. Occasionally, they may not fuse. And these should not be mistaken for uh, fractures or uh, other pathological conditions. And sometimes there is a asymmetrical, for example, one on your left side, and the right side is uh, almost fused. On the left side, there is an excessive callus, new bone formation. This is what is called ischiopubic synchondosis and should not be mistaken for a healing fracture. Congenital hyperplasia of the left hemipelvis, look at the asymmetry between the right and the left. And this is uh, atrophy, atrophy of the hip bones, innominate bones, and partial absence of the sacred bones. This is all congenital developmental disorder. Then we come to the fibrous dysplasia. This is a fibrous aberration of a developing bone. It could be monostotic, polyostotic, and when it is polyostotic, particularly in girls, if there is a sexual precocity and skin pigmentation, it is called Albright syndrome. And in monostotic uh, fibrous dysplasia, usually it is localized and generally it occurs in the tubular bones. There is a rind surrounding it and the matrix is smoky or ground glass appearance that is typical of fibrous dysplasia. Commonly it occurs in the neck of the femur and occasionally it may produce coxa vera, coxa valga or even the so called the shepherd's crook deformity. For example, if you take the middle picture, it looks like a cystic disease, a solitary cyst or aneurysmal bone cyst, but it is neither. If you see carefully, it is expanding, no doubt, it is aggressive, no doubt. Look at the margins, it says it is benign, but at the same time, if you look at the matrix, it is smoky. So it is a fibrous placia with a fracture, repeated fractures may heal part of the bone. And one on your extreme right side, it is the so-called shepherd's crook deformity. It is in a three-year-old child, not the deformity and also increased bone density with a smoky type of matrix. Congenital dysplasia of the hip uh, with dislocation. Actually, the etiology is dysplasia. And then what are the factors? Either a tear or laxity of the capsule and the ligaments surrounding it. And then there is a primary estabular dysplasia. Lots of people say it is a secondary dysplastic hip estabulum, but uh, pathologically and uh, clinically, as you notice the fetus from the childhood, you know that there is a estabular dysplasia and secondary dislocation of the hip of varying degrees. The one on your uh, left side superiorly, it is the normal. Normal in the sense the head and the stabulum are in the right position. There are certain angles that you will see. The Shenton's line is smooth, Perkins lines, all these are measurements. Frankly, you don't have to have measurements provided you have acute vision and inspection and perception of the normal anatomy and the variation or abnormal anatomy in the dislocation of the hip associated with estabular dysplasia. And then one on your uh, left extremely low, there is bilateral dislocation of the hip. About 10% of the patients do have bilateral dislocation. The most important part is early detection of this estabular dysplasia and dislocation of the hip. By ultrasonography, the experts say they could diagnose early estabular dysplasia. On plain films, these are the various findings leading to deformities, dislocations, absence of the 
or a partial absence of the head of the femur ossification early on. And radiologically, one, conventional radiology we are talking of, not ultrasound or anything, delayed appearance of femoral ossification center. Normally, the femoral ossification center occurs between three to six months. And then Shenton's line, that is the line drawn along the superior margin of the obturator foramen and then bringing it up and bring it down along the neck of the femur. It should be smooth. Any disruption indicates early dislocation. Triangular area of sclerosis in the upper estabulum, flattening of the estabulum or the estabular angle is shallow. Posterior and upward dislocation, of course, that is obvious. And so occasionally, a false acetabulum, because of the dislocation, the nature provides a false acetabular cavity, that is, double acetabular cavity, in order to accommodate the femoral head. Then comes the important entity called proximal femoral focal deficiency, PFFD. And this is dysgenesis of the proximal. Femur, it is developmental again. There are five major types described. Mostly it is unilateral. The first one described was Amsterdam's in 1968. Since then, several forms have been described, and here also early detection and diagnosis is important in order to correct the deformity orthopedically. Type A results from an insult to the limb bud early in fetal life before the development of the hip joint has been completed. There is no familiar tendency for this. Look at the hip on the left side. There is shepherd's crook deformity, but there is no fibrous dysplasia. And if you look carefully, the femoral shaft is shortened because of the focal femoral deficiency at the neck and the proximal shaft of the femur. Major deficiency of the proximal shaft here. And orthogram just to show whether there is a capital femoral head and which you can see. As we said earlier, the proximal femoral focal deficiency is seen in five types. Congenital short femur with bowing, coxavara, but normal stabulum. This is type 1. Type 2, short femur, subtrochantic pseudoarthrosis, progressive coxavara and again normal stabulum. Third, short femur, with the bulbous proximal end, delayed appearance of capital epiphysis, mild dysplastic acetabulum in the third type. Fourth, short femur segment, tapering sharply to a point, as if there is a pencil end which we have seen earlier. At the proximal end, acetabulum becomes progressively dysplastic. Type 5, small bone segment representing the distal femoral shaft only, with no evidence of proximal femoral components and no absolutely no epicenter. Ipsilateral fibular hemimelia is also noted in the fifth type. What is the importance of having these types for surgical correction and for prognosis? Proximal focal femoral deficiency denotes a congenital defect as we said earlier in the development and growth of the proximal portion of the femur that leads to coxavara deformity and shortening of the femoral shaft. The femoral neck angle is acute. By definition, some femoral shaft is always present because it is called proximal femoral focal deficiency. Idiopathic coxavara is a part of this PFFD spectrum if the varus is associated with congenital femoral shortening at birth. That is type 1. These are the various morphological features and the diagnostic features of proximal femoral focal deficiency and uh, MRI also shows the star image shows the cartilaginous portion of the femoral head. Conventional radiographic findings, short femur because of the proximal deficiency, laterally situated, proximally displaced, distal femur by definition is present either partly or it all depends upon how much of the segment is present. Spectrum of proximal deficiencies from 1 millimeter to 10 centimeters. Wide spectrum. 
and there are two examples of proximal focal femoral deficiency. Please note it should be distinguished from congenital dislocation of the hip. In congenital dislocation of the hip, there is no shortening of the femur. And then coxa vera, idiopathic coxa vera of childhood. It occurs in many disastrous type of syndromes, but idiopathic also can occur. Normally, particularly in adults, the neck shaft angle, femoral neck and shaft angle varies from 120 to 125 degrees. At one year, it is 148 degrees. At five years, it's 135 degrees. And again, there are two types. Type 1 in the congenital form, generally present, of course, at birth. Infantile form, not present at birth, recognized at around four years of age. And often, it is bilateral. Often means 33% at least. What are the radiographic findings? Usually bilateral. As I said, it is more than 33%. Vertically inclined epiphyseal plate. Head low in estabulum. Femoral head is low in the estabulum. Outline of head may appear woolly. Hazing. Secondary deformity of the estabulum. Not primary dysplasia. Triangular bone fragment at lower part of femoral neck. Greater trochanter curved. Articulating with ilium. Also, there is what is called acquired coxa vera. The femoral angle is much less than 120, which occurs in rickets, fibrous dysplasia, osteogenesis imperfecta, either congenita or tarda, cranial dysplasia, pectis disease, following slipped capital femoral epiphysis. You can get, it's just a deformity. And that deformity is the sequelae of so many other systemic and local disorders. We have to know certain definitions. What is coxa magna? Deformity with the widening of thermal head and neck. Often occurs in epiphyseal dysplasia or type 4 developmental dysplasia of hip. And occasionally in septic arthritis also. A healed septic arthritis when there is hyperemia and the if it is bigger, it won't regress. Coxa plana, classical example is pectus disease, where is, there is flattening of the epiphysis of the femoral head. Coxa valga, increase in the angle of neck and shaft. We said earlier it may vary between 120 or 125. Increased angle. And then sometimes it may be quite straight. It occurs in uh, cleidocranial disasters again, exostosis, multiple exostosis or osteochondromata, marcios, and in polio also. Coxa vera, decrease in the angle of neck and shaft, which we have seen earlier in the idiopathic uh, coxa vera, and it occurs in osteogenesis imperfecta, proximal femoral focal deficiency. There is another word called autopelvis, that is primary protrusion estabula. It may be developmental, but often you may see in uh, Osteomalacia, particularly in women with osteomalacia, you can see protrusion is You can also see in rheumatoid arthritis and other acquired conditions also. Now we will come to the inflammatory conditions. Usually inflammatory condition of a joint is called arthritis. Several types of arthritis. Degenerative arthritis, inflammatory arthritis, infective arthritis, either viral, bacterial, fungal, spirochetal, metabolic or endocrinal causes may produce secondary arthritis and of course there are miscellaneous causes. Metabolic and endocrine disorders, for example gout is a metabolic disease. Ordinarily it affects the feet and hands but it may affect the hip also. Polyarticular CPPD, CPPD is calcium, pyrophosphate deposition disease. Otherwise called pseudogout. Generally, it is manifested by the calcification of the hyaline and fibrocartilages. Acromegaly, because of the increase in the size of the head and because of the hypertrophy of the cartilage, it may produce some symptoms. Hemochromatosis, ochronosis, alcaptonuria, where you can find again calcification and degenerative changes. Wilson disease, copper metabolism disturbance, 
There also you may find chondrocalcinosis. Hyperparathyroidism because of the subarticular and subperiosteal desorption of bone with erosions and resulting in osteoarthritis or degenerative arthritis superimposed on erosive type of arthritis. Now, how do you analyze arthritis? There must be some rule A, B, C, D, E, S. And let us see this mnemonic. How does it help? A, alignment of the joints. If it is not aligned, if it is called malaligned, subluxation, dislocation, or occasionally telescoping. And bone density, it is important. Is there paraarticular osteoporosis? Or is there lack of paraarticular osteoporosis? Cartilage, is it thinned, atrophied, hypertrophied, such as we described in acromegaly, or is it calcified? And then distribution. See, certain disorder, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, it is often bilateral, symmetrical. Whereas degenerative arthritis could be bilateral, but often comes unilaterally first and then bilaterally. And then we come with erosion. Erosions you see classically in rheumatoid arthritis, all inflammatory type of arthritis and infective type of arthritis and metabolic type of arthritis also. Hibernation is exactly the opposite of erosion, namely there is reactive sclerosis at the articular margins. Enthesopathy, osteophyte formation. This is often seen in degenerative arthritis, but uh, you can also see in ankylosing spondylitis and uh, seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, etc. Soft tissue changes. Is there a soft tissue swelling? Of course, when we are talking about the hip, the fat planes may be displaced or there may be localized soft tissue swelling. So you have to know this, or the soft tissue is atrophy, such as you get in atrophy and hemiplegia. So you have to carefully look into the soft tissues. Is there calcification? Synovial chondromatosis, you may get calcification. Tuberculosis, occasionally tuberculosis. Abscess may get uh, calcified in the soft tissue. So one has to look into all these parameters, A, B, C, D, E, S. If you follow this pattern, Analyze carefully and if you add and subtract, I'm sure you will come to a different two diagnosis. Alignment, as we said, subluxation, dislocation, discombobulation. What is discombobulation? Complete disruption of the joint, such as occurs in neuropathic type of joint. Protrusio stabilize, we have said, and then telescoping one into the other often occurs in erosive type of arthritis. The absorption of the head and neck in neuropathic also you can get a telescoping of the uh, joint. Degenerative joint disease or the osteoarthritis, early subluxation. Frankly, there must be some deformity, some defect in the design of the hip joint, namely the acetabulum, head and neck of the femur, in order to cause osteoarthritis in some people. See, ordinarily we say in stress-bearing joints, osteoarthritis occurs, that too as the patient gets older. Lack of design of the hip has great significance in the development of osteoarthritis. That's one of the theories. Apart from the precipitating factors such as minor trauma, weight-bearing, stress, etc. The one on your right side, the film shows, Major findings. See, how do you say it is degenerative joint disease only or osteoarthritis? Several things. One, there is no paraarticular osteoporosis. Two, the cartilage is thinned, particularly in the weight bearing area, outer and superior margin of the hip joint. And then, instead of erosion, of course, there are erosions also, subarticular cysts. But majority of these cases show hibernation, reactive sclerosis, as if it is trying to support with the new bone. And these are the major manifestations of a osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease. And then there is a primary degenerative joint disease called primary osteoarthritis. And there is secondary degenerative joint disease, that is, after trauma, after healing of infection, after inflammation, after surgery, all these, you can get a post-traumatic, for example, one on your left is the patient had trauma, neck of the femur and healed and eventually 
resulted in osteoarthritis. One on your right side is again degenerative joint disease. With, uh, it is a little advanced. Subarticular cystic changes are noted. These are also sometimes called geodes. A geode is a radiolucent area which is caused by increased synovial pressure, intraarticular synovial pressure, and the fluid is pumped into the subarticular area and sometimes to a distant place like the neck of the femur. The osteopenia that you see is because of the old age. Eight year old, you don't expect the bones to be normal. 